we, we look at, you know, uh, just this exponential increase in, you know, things like food allergies, you know, the IgE mediated food allergies, um, things like even even higher level, you know, neural wiring uh, sort of autism spectrum, ADHD, those are starting to point back to the gut, the development of, you know, the gut and early early population of uh, and colonization of the good bacteria patterns there and and so and, and again it's all connected food supply uh, cesarean birth even you know I mean it, they can catch up to um, you know natural birth it takes about six months to, to catch up in fact to, for gut populations to, to reach the sort of equal levels as you would see in, in a vaginal birth and so you know even even there in the very beginning we, we start to see you know, potential deficiencies. And Hello and welcome to the Chris Will Podcast on iCode Media. Today is the final episode of 2023. This wraps up our fifth year of podcasting. It's kind of crazy. Uh, and I get to do it with my, my friend that we've become friends over the years, Dr. Jim Stringham. We talked about gut health and why we should think about gut health related to our ocular health and ocular inflammation. Uh, I think Jim explain this in a way that was digestible for me, no pun intended. Uh, and I, I have been trying to kind of make the connection really reasonably, and I had not been able to do it well until, until this conversation with Jim. So please enjoy our conversation. As always, be sure to subscribe to the podcast, write a review, share it with your friends, and support those who support us. My patients with macular degeneration want clear and succinct recommendations from me related to products and solutions that can benefit their long-term ocular health and vision. To do this for my patients, I need to be confident that what I'm recommending will have a benefit to them. And that's why my supplement of choice is MacuHealth. MacuHealth is specifically formulated and clinically proven to rebuild and maximize macular pigment over a lifetime. This results in enhanced visual performance and aids in the treatment and prevention of age-related macular degeneration. I've discussed carotenoid absorption on this podcast with Dr. Nolans and Stringham, and MacuHealth uses a patented process called micromycel technology. And this technology is clinically proven to increase carotenoid concentrations at the target tissue and deliver the highest level of bioavailability studied to date. MacuHealth has been great for my patients. We really feel like we have the ability to help those patients in all categories of macular degeneration. If you're not utilizing MacuHealth for your patients, check it out for yourself by contacting your MacuHealth representative. I want to discuss the MyDay Toric contact lens for a minute. When I'm reaching for a daily lens for my patients, I need to know that it will be available in parameters that I want and it needs to work. This improves my chair time and my patient satisfaction. The MyDay Toric features the same optical lens design features as the most prescribed monthly replacement Toric lens on the market. MyDay Toric now completely mirrors the Biofinity Toric's parameter range. To be clear, if you find the parameter in a Biofinity Toric, you can find it in a MyDay Toric. This Toric lens design is multifaceted to ensure optimal visual acuity, lens stability, fit, and comfort. Its uniform horizontal ISO thickness and wide ballast band quickly orient the lens for better performance and simplified fitting. The MyDay material is CooperVision's softest one-day silicone hydrogel lens and features Aquaform technology combining a unique balance of high oxygen permeability and natural wettability. The result is a highly breathable lens that keeps our patient's eyes looking clear, white, and healthy. So if you haven't started utilizing MyDay Toric in your practice, I'd encourage you to reach out to your CooperVision representative to get started. So um, so you're the chief scientific officer. Is that your official title at Mackey Health, right? Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's correct, yeah. And, you know, what, so a couple of years ago, you mentioned you brought up Colorado. Um, so my... Um, one of my kid's godmothers, uh, Jackie Munson, she practices in Colorado. And uh, and I had her on the podcast maybe three years ago, maybe a little bit longer. And yeah. she was talking about gut health. And I'll tell you, Jim, like my brain was like, she was way over my head. Uh, she like she was all in on this stuff before it was cool or maybe when it was starting to be cool. And I'm not sure that it's necessarily cool, quote unquote, right now, but it's super interesting to me. And, and what I thought when I was walking away from that discussion is like, I am woefully 
um, unprepared to have this type of conversation. I understand it's probably important or I understand it is important, but I've got, I don't have any idea. And how does gut health impact ocular health? And I, 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 I do actually think there's a lot of intertwining there, but no capabilities to really have that discussion. And here we are three and a half later, years later, and I still have no capability to have that discussion. And that's one of the things that I thought would be really helpful because I think as you start to think about things differently, and it, it seems like that was something you're pretty passionate about right now, you're starting to think about like, well, how is this intertwined with that? And so what I was hoping to get from your kind of insight in terms of kind of a deep dive study of it. And um, it kind of helped me understand, all right, well, what are you thinking about from a physiologic standpoint and then an ocular standpoint and a neurological standpoint? Because Macula does a lot of both brain stuff and eye stuff uh, in addition to kind of whole body health. What, like, what do I need to be thinking about within gut health? So this is, exceptionally complex. I mean, if you, if you want to drive yourself crazy, study the immune system, you know, and this is largely, I mean, the gut is 70% of the immune system. And wait, pause on that just a second, Jim, because yeah. explain that a little bit more in depth. When, when people say that, what do you mean it's 70% of the immune system? Well, you know, this, this symbiosis, uh, the, uh, that's basically living organism. I mean, consider this, we have roughly 40 trillion cells in the human body, 40 trillion, okay? Which is almost impossible to imagine, right? And so it, that's- It that's is impossible. Human cells, right? There are roughly 40 trillion microbes in the human gut microbiome. And nearly equal, really, amount of these bugs, so to speak, uh, that we coexist with. I mean, we've, you know, this, this dance between, you know, bacteria and, and our own cells. And so, you know, when you look at it that way, I mean, who's the host? You know, who's running the show here? I mean, you know, we like to think yeah, of us, us as them. being the boss, right? Yeah, maybe <laughs> yeah, not. So. No, it was actually, no, pause there for a second because I was, there was um, something I was reading about where like there is a microorganism. I don't know if it's a cricket or a grasshopper or something that like weasels its way into the neurological system of this grasshopper and causes it to do things. So it's like, w which one is really uh, is controlling here? Right, right, right. Anyway, exactly, sorry. and and you know, no, no, no. I, I I've heard of this this uh, same yeah little virulent critter that gets in there and, and does its thing. Yeah, so it's it's real. It's a real thing. Um, yeah. So the seventy percent of the immune system. I mean, it's this is fascinating. I mean, I'm a, I'm a vision scientist. I have to qualify. I'm not and and a neuroscientist, but I I don't you know I'm not I'm not a microbiologist. But this area has got me so intrigued that for the past three or four years, I've been really, really getting into it. And so, yeah, in the more you dig, the more you learn. So the 70% of the immune system number, which is, which is out there, been kind of sort of tossed around, verified over the years, it has to do with that, you know, amount of material that really dictates our immune function. And it starts very early. And so you, you think about things like uh, macular degeneration and, you know, I get, I get some pushback uh, from, from doctors when I talk to them about, you know, ocular, you know, sort of health and, and the eye is an immune privileged organ, right? And so what that means is that, you know, most of the immune mediators, uh, they're conspicuously absent from the eye. Uh, and that's for good reason. We don't want, you know, the immune system, the innate immune system, particularly to go out of control and, you know, cause, you know, massive inflammation in, in the retina or corneal surface. And so, you know, you, you can't, you know, there's privilege there. And so it reduces that to protect the tissue from, from damage by our own immune system. So, you know, where does it come from? Well, what's happening is that over time, and, and we'll, I'll, I'll cover some of the be very beginning, the calibration of the immune system when you're very young, right after birth. But uh, effectively, if you have this dysbiosis, this imbalance in even good bacteria, you compromise gut barrier function. So this mucosal lining in the gut uh, that, you know, it's sort of a Goldilocks kind of a thing where you need the gut barrier to be thin enough to allow absorption of nutrients and important things that need to access the bloodstream, but then thick enough so that you're not causing, you know, gut inflammation uh, in infants, you know, this is the, you know, necrotizing enterocolitis or, you know, maybe we've got, you know, uh, IBD in, in adults, you know, where the gut barrier function is mm -hmm. 
compromise. When that happens, then you get inflammation, inflammatory you know, products like pro-inflammatory cytokines that gain access through the gut wall. They, you know, and where they shouldn't be. Yes, systemic. And then this creates a pattern and it's literally known as, as a pattern like pathogen response that, you know, interacts with ocular tissues and it says, okay, there's something wrong here. And then that promotes ocular inflammation. And, you know, it, there are connections. Both, with, so you think that with ocular inflammation would be, um, ocular surface inflammation, but also like retinal inflammation, macular degeneration? Yeah, both, exactly. And, and it, it ha can happen very slowly. So you think the macular degeneration, it's a disease of aging, neurodegenerative disease. Uh, you know, those over 60 are at higher risk. But really, when you think about it from the standpoint of the gut, it's starting from the beginning. You calibrate these, you know, sort of patterns of microbes, uh, the balance, uh, and that really determines, you know, this low grade, potential low grade inflammation over the lifespan. And this is what we're talking about with regard to neurodegenerative disease in general, uh, you know, talking about retina, brain, uh, you know, this low grade inflammation, it kind of flies under the radar. Um, a lot of us are walking around with this, um, you know, sugars can greatly impact the, the gut microbiome, the gut barrier function and integrity. So what, what would sugars then tend to thin it? That would be, it would thin the microbiome? It, it would thin, it would, it would thin the gut uh, mucosal lining and, and okay. that would compromise, you know, this integrity and allow more access to, you know, the system, you know, systemic circulation of these pro-inflammatory uh, mediators, agents, cytokines, these kinds of things. And so, uh, yeah, the, the balance gets thrown off. And, and you know, you, you, you start to dig in a little deeper and you see, wow, these patterns of, you know, the Western diet, the American diet, uh, high fat diets. And then you look at animal models of dry eye, for instance, uh, high fat diet, you know, greatly impacts dry eye, um, you know, status. And, and, you know, it can produce dry eye disease in mice, just a high what? fat diet. What kind of, so I'm assuming you're not talking about um, omega-3 fats. You're talking about what, no, what types yeah, of fats this is specifically? A, more of the saturated fats, uh, mm -hmm. you know, animal fats, uh, other than fish, uh, of course. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And yeah, I appreciate the clarification because the opposite has been found for omega, omega-3s, uh, DHA and EPA. It's interesting, uh, you know, you, you look at animal models there. Of course, we have human data as well that indicate benefit. And, you know, a lot of what, you know, how I certainly used to think about things is that, okay, you, you consume the nutrients, the nutrients are absorbed into the bloodstream, and then they do things around the body. You know, these carotenoids may go to the eye, fish oils get deposited in, in special areas in the brain, uh, systemic anti-inflammatory, etc. But we're missing a step. And I think we need to look at almost everything we consume as a two-step process. So there's, you know, this digestion part, and then there are undigestible elements that we don't have the genes to digest certain components of food that this gut microbiome, the bacteria do. And when they do, they have special effects. They produce short chain fatty acids. They you know, regulate the pH in the gut. They, you know, I mentioned improve and, you know, sustain this gut barrier, the mucosal lining. And, and so what you see is that, you know, pro-inflammatory cytokines like that are associated with dry eye disease, for instance, if you uh, increase your level of omega-3s coming in, they actually change uh, the distribution of certain bacteria in the gut that results in a reduced uh, production of IL-17 which is corneal surface uh, inflammation found in great amounts in those with dry eye disease. So it's like, wow, okay. And then it also improves gut barrier function. So you're not only reducing IL-17, again, the immune system is largely in the gut producing these things. And so you're reducing the amount, you're reducing access to the system to gain access to potentially the cornea um, you know, through this indirect mechanism. And, and so that's the truth with leafy green vegetables. I mean, we talk about, you know, fiber undigestible by us. It passes through and we've known for a long time about, you know, the benefits of fiber uh, to health. 
Not until fairly recently, really the last 30 or 40 years, do we realize that the benefits are coming from them acting as prebiotics. So we've all heard of probiotics, the actual bacteria. Well, prebiotics actually feed the bacteria. The bacteria. Mm. And, and so you're, you're producing, so it's, we're digesting what we can digest, stomach acids, salivary enzymes. The, the gut bacteria are taking what they can digest and they're either fermenting off. I mean, yes, sometimes you eat high fiber foods, you get gassy and, and that can be unpleasant. It can, it can be a sign of health as well. Uh, but uh, that's but you're, hilarious. You're, that's one. Isn't it funny? Yeah, I'm going to so tell my that, wife that. <laughs> Dr. Stringham said, yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Right. Just, yep. I'm healthy. Yeah. Yep. I know. Okay. So yeah, I, I give you my blessing <laughs> anyway. So you're, you're producing all of these, um, you know, products that, that we don't make, but that, you know, again, going back to this dance with, you know, the bugs, uh, they were, were coexisting. We're, you know, they're living in us. We're deriving benefit from them. And, uh, and so, uh, it, it's really interesting to to think about digestion and and the foods we consume and what we're exposed to in our environment, how that impacts all of this, this balance and 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 health and and you know ocular health. It's it's weird to think it's so different from the gut, but you know of course it leads to better systemic health and and then that of course impacts you know ocular health. Well, you know there's a so you know generally speaking, I would say like I've got a um... You know, I don't have any problems with my stomach, probably my GI system, but there was a couple years ago where something was out of whack. I don't know what it was. I don't know what uh, spawned it, but I just like always had this sensation of like, I mean, we'll, we'll do it on the podcast. I felt just, I felt bloated and I felt mm -hmm. like, um, like there was always kind of like, I couldn't really like keep everything like into my stomach. Not like I was vomiting or didn't have diarrhea, but I just felt like, oh, like, Something's not right. right. And it took yeah. me, I, I don't know what I did. I mean, I, I, I started uh, taking a prebiotic. Um, I cut out caffeine. Um, I, uh, you know, it was that kind of stuff. And then it just sort of slowly went away. And it was one of those things, like I, I started thinking about like, holy cow, I'm 40 years old. Like this is a couple of years ago, I'm 40 years old. Is this what it's going to be like to just keep getting older <laughs> and feeling like my GI system is out of whack? But it, it did make me think a lot about, like one, have a ton of empathy for people who struggle with this stuff their entire life. And then two, um, like what did I do to get it out of whack? And what did I do to get it back into whack? Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. And I don't know the answer to that, but, but a lot of this just makes me start thinking about, you know, um, my 15 year old son is like gung ho his cross country coach this year. Uh, and he's become like a real cross country stud runner. It's been awesome to see. I I'm right. trying not to let it get to his head, but, um, but he really took it to heart. Like what you eat, what you put in your body is going to make a difference in how you perform. And, and he really kind of embraced that. And so he's like reading labels, like, Nope, not going to eat that. Not going to do this. And, um, and so then it, it comes down like full circle of, what you're talking about is like, okay, well, just this low grade inflammation was probably, I, I probably did something It might've been stress. It might've been food related. It might've been something that kind of stripped that gut, uh, I biome. I, I had a hard time rebuilding it or it took a while to rebuild it. Mm -hmm. And then once it finally did, it was fine. Yeah. But then you start thinking about like, I, I was doing some reading recently about even just, um, some of the chemicals that are in just our normal foods and, and the likelihood of Alzheimer's and like you're talking about neurodegenerative diseases yeah. and you know, the inflammatory stuff. And so I'm looking at my son and I'm like, man, he's probably making good decisions now. And my, my diet is pretty good. Like I would say it's not mm -hmm. bad with fast food, snack food, almost never. But, yeah. um, but then you can get into this and you just like, how do you function? And that's where I'm, I'm coaching him on is like Lincoln, like you got to do this, but, but like, don't be a weirdo. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so how do you do it and not be a weirdo? It's, it's a, it's a really difficult and sort of unusual task. Uh, you know, we're living in this extremely hygienic world now. Mm. And, you know, you've probably heard of this hygienic hypothesis where, you know, we're almost too clean, limiting the amount of bacteria. Again, you know, there are pathogenic bacteria and of course these beneficial bacteria. 
And the interesting thing about the beneficial bacteria, and this is probably what happened to you, and I, I would suspect that it's probably stress because that can really affect things, and which could mean even not that you're you know, psychological stress, but, you know, lack of sleep potentially, even for, you know, three or four days, that can impact the gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. It could have been something you ate that impacts, just brings down one, like there's, you know, this ratio, and, and I won't get too deep into the weeds, and, and I'll be frank with you, I don't know all the details, but there are populations of bacteria, uh, these firmicutes and bacteroidetes, that uh, there's a ratio there, and they're both you know considered healthy bacteria. They have different functions. So in obesity, in risk for macular degeneration, you see the firmicutes higher than the bacteroidetes, and and so and, and it's interesting because firmicutes they have a lot of benefits. Uh, they they lead to improved you know short chain fatty acid uh, you know function, which leads to all sorts of benefits. But however, they they improve or they they cause a conversion of carbohydrates more readily into fats. So that turns into higher blood fat, um, mm -hmm. higher inflammation in the body. So the body reacts to these, you know, um, and storage on fats, adipocytes, the fats that are stored mm -hmm. on the body actually secrete pro-inflammatory material. And so it's mm -hmm. like, ah, you know, it's all this big feedback loop. And that's just a change in that balance. And I mean, I don't think this is what happened to you necessarily, but it could be some sort of dysbiosis. You feel it, you know it. And, you know, I know you, you're an athlete, you're in tune with your body, you eat well. And so any little thing that's off, and I'm the same way. It's like mm, something's not right. You feel and it. yeah, yeah, you, you know, and it's like, you know, when you're hitting on all cylinders and you also know when you're off. And so, um, you know, that, that gut brain axis, and, and this is a... <laughs> An interesting point I want to make here is that I think in 10 to 15 years, we're going to completely recapitulate how we look at disease, especially when it comes to the gut microbiome and, and you know, food, uh, diet, those kinds of things. Because if you dig into the data now, you see terms like gut brain axis, gut retina mm -hmm. axis, gut skin axis, gut pancreas liver axis, everything goes through the gut. And so... And again, like I mentioned before, it's this sort of parallel two-step process of looking at how the gut processes things and how we process things. And they work together. They're designed to work together to produce an optimal outcome. And, and it's all about diversity. And, and, you know, my recommendation to Lincoln would be, you know, to not, again, don't go too crazy. Don't get too weird about it. Diversity is really the key, the major takeaway here. Diversity of foods that you eat, wide variety, again, sticking to the general principles. You, know, you can look at the Mediterranean diet, which by the way, has been shown to produce greater microbiome diversity, better ratios like we talked about with these healthy ones. So they do what they're supposed to do and not what they're not supposed to do. Um, you know, so I would, I would stick to, to stuff like that. Um, you know, it's, it's easy, I think, in this day and age with the internet, all sorts of information out there, and you know, talk about protein carb ratios and all that stuff. You know, you, you hit those things, but then you're missing a lot of the other, the secondary, um, yeah. you know, sort of effects uh, of of the foods. And you know, so I think that a variety of foods is is fine. I mean, you know, it, no offense to you know to vegans or vegetarians, but you know including, you know, everything, all, uh, you know, meats, leafy greens, nuts, um, you know, even, even some simple carbs and, you know, is fine, but a balance is, is really where it's at. You know, I've got a, so, um, the, so I'm building a new building for my practice and one of my partners is an orthodontist and he's a seven year old orthodontist. And he, uh, you know, he is, I think he's been, he doesn't eat red meat, uh, hasn't for a long time. Um, but he does eat fish, uh, some of the time, most of the time he is, he's, um, he's vegan or maybe vegan. I just don't know about most of the time he, 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 he stays away from, from animal mm -hmm. protein, but not exclusively. Um, uh, yeah. but I think, you know, I, I am, you know, I, I could change my thinking on this, but I've, I've always thought I said, well, Clark one, I like, I like meat. He'll say he doesn't even have a taste for it anymore. Like yeah. if, if he stops eating it, he doesn't really even think, Oh, I wish I had that. But, um, the, 
I think I could be convinced to go down that road, but it would be a hard road to go down. I like yeah. your pr- approach of of saying because I I do like to eat a lot of different things, and sometimes mm-hmm. I even feel like man I I just want I want some broccoli or I want like a spinach yeah. salad, uh, and then I I wonder how much of that is the mind control that the bacteria in my gut are are saying hey, you know we want yeah. we want you to have this. Uh, exactly. What do you think about that? Yeah, I I think that, you know, cravings and, you know, I'm I'm with you on this. It's like there are days where it's like I need a big spinach salad. I need a ton of stuff. I just want (laughs) to chew on that stuff and get it in my body. And, and, you know, I think, well, I've got to be careful because I I know all of the benefits, of course, and some of that's cognitive. Um, But I really do think that it's it's a drive. It seems more sort of core uh, in terms of like a, you know, a craving. And, and yeah. so I, and when you when you then look at the data, like, for instance, we talk about the Mediterranean diet, uh, most of those effects were brought on if you do, you know, sort of discriminant analysis and you and you look at this particular components of the Mediterranean diet, you see that it's fish and it's the vegetables. And, and so those are the two main drivers. Um, Another thing about about meat and a lot of people think, well, you know, I and I I like meat occasionally and, you know, I eat a fair amount of chicken, not as much red meat. But we if you look at human history, you know, a long time ago, we sort of had to eat a lot of plants. Um, that's what kind of kept us alive. And then, you know, it's it's speculated that, you know, the killing the animal or whatever was a more rare event. And so it was maybe once every couple of weeks, we had animal flesh, you know, to eat. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if you if you look at the common American animal diet, animal flesh. I know, right? I can just see. I, went into I can just see Jim with mode. blood on his hands. You know, <laughs> finally the, yeah. after weeks. Oh yeah, that's right. Oh man, it's <laughs> tearing into the salmon yeah. like the bear. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I love salmon too. But anyway, <laughs> <So do> um, <laughs> tear, tear it apart. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah. So I, I think that, you know, we, we have to put it in perspective there. And, and if you go back to what sort of human physiology was designed on, including these microbes, uh, it's, it's largely based on this wide variety of plants, fruits, nuts, vegetables, uh, you know, and, and a little bit of meat. And, and so, and, and then bringing up meat, you see, uh, it's, it's crazy. The, the food supply has changed pretty yeah. radically in the last 50 or 60 years. One of the things, of course, that they give animals is antibiotics. Mm. Ding, ding, ding. What does that do? Well, of course, mm. you're going to, and, and it's not done for health reasons. It's done for growth. So you can grow larger animals, you know, and, and you know, I bring them to market. You get more money and all of that, of course. But you know, money, the root of all evil. <laughs> Here we are. Well, uh, but, yeah. uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, I know I you're being but, facetious, but, but I mean, the, the reality is, is it's the game, right? It's the balance of, yeah. of what you got to. Yeah, that's right. And, and so, you know, and, and, and what people can afford and, and yeah. And, and, you know, certainly red meat is still the, the number one, you know, sort of bang for the buck food. If you want to stay alive, feed your family, you know, red meat will do it. And a lot of people don't want to hear that, but that's, you know, just in terms of nutrition and all that protein, um, you know, all of that stuff. But the antibiotics uh, that are present, you know, by, you know, just the necessity, they kill a lot of the, you know, um, bacterial species, both good and bad. And so there's less diversity that we're putting into the body And again, we don't want to put pathogenic bacteria into our system, of course, but our system's designed to take care of those, actually, when it's working well. Uh, And that is largely due to the healthy bacteria. Um, It's wild that, you know, a healthy gut microbiome can actually, when it detects the presence of pathogenic bacteria, it can lower the pH of the intestinal lumen. It makes it more acidic, kills the pathogenic bacteria, so... The healthy bacteria are more resistant to lower pH, by the way. So they, mm. they are like literally controlling that, lowering it. And then when the pathogenic bacteria population has reached this critical, you know, it's dying down, uh, then it raises the pH back up to make it a little more hospitable mm. for everybody, the good guys. Uh, so, it, I mean, isn't that wild? I mean, yeah. it, you can also act as, you know, sort of intestinal wall cell receptor decoys. So, you know, the, the prebiotics like from fiber, 
uh, they actually, if you eat a lot of that in your diet, pathogenic bacteria latch onto those thinking they're docking on the intestine mm. where they would n normally promote infection. They, they don't, they actually mm. are happy. They sit there and they're floating along in, you know, the intestinal lumen and then a, whatever's floating along in there finds its way out the back door, you know, eventually. And so it doesn't do its, you know, infection promotion and, and all of that. So, you know, it's this really cool system, you know, and again, thinking about this, not just from a, oh, uh, vegetables are healthy. Yeah, they are. Uh, the nutrients get into your body. They do good things. But it's like those vegetables do 28,000 other things that we, you know, are unaware of uh, that benefit us. And, um, and you, you just have to go back in history, human history, a little ways to, to see that. And, you know, you look at hunter-gatherer societies before, you know, I've looked at the Hadza tribe in Tanzania and you look at their gut microbiome diversity and it's like an order of magnitude greater than ours, than Western society. And then you look at rates of infection, disease, incredibly low in that population. And they, they live so much differently than we do, of course. It's, it would horrify you <laughs> to see some of the, you know, they, they're very dirty. They're you know, washing their hands in the stomach acid of zebras. I mean, it's like, wow. Wow, you know, I don't know about that. You know, it's, it's kind of crazy. But that's where we sort of came from. And, uh, and that's kind of how we're designed. I'm not suggesting we go back to that way of life. But, you know, just consider some of the benefits of, of that kind of thing. You know, it's, it's okay to get a little dirty. Uh, it's, it's certainly a good thing to eat more diverse foods um, because then you get the diverse microbiome, all the benefits there. Yeah, I, I think that there's this um, – I don't, I don't think I want to be washing my hands in the, the gut of a zebra. But, um, but I do think that, you know, uh, even, even – I mean, this is a, I mean, much a much larger conversation, but even the way I grew up is pretty different than the way my kids grew up. I mean, even, even – take COVID out of the equation. Although I think COVID that time we were hyper aware of, of back, you know, uh, transmitting anything and being ultra sterile. Sure. Um, and I don't, you know, I wonder what subconsciously has stuck with me from that time. Even as I've, I've, I've mentioned this on the podcast before, even, even as I took a, a, a I feel like a relatively reasonable approach. I still think there's probably stuff that I do now that's automatic that wasn't automatic before. One, one is just like, um, you know, I wash my hand. I've always washed my hands in between patients, but now it's like, not only do I wash my hands in between patients, but even when I touch something, I've just, I've, it's become ingrained where I kind of spray my hands off, uh, after I see the patient, yeah. you know, like, in be, like while I'm seeing the patient, I might spray my hands once or twice, you know, and, and I, I'm sure I don't even think about that anymore. Um, my point is, is that like how much of that transition over time has impacted all the things, right? So now not only is it the gut biome, it's just my experiences with now my body wants to fight something, but it's not going to fight something that it needs to fight. It's going to fight other things. And so we have more allergic conjunctivitis and we have more aller, you know, allergy, allergic rhinitis and, um, you know, autoimmune sure. diseases. So, I mean, you kind of <clears throat> unpack all of that and, you know, I don't know, I'm, I'm an optometrist. I don't, I don't know these things uh, in detail. Right. Yeah. So, so what am I to do then as, as a clinician? I mean, how do I have these conversations with patients in a way that uh, is effective um, and really impacts their, their long, you know, their long-term uh, ocular health and systemic health? Uh, these are great questions. And you're right. The patterns are there. Uh, we, we look at, you know, uh, just this exponential increase in, you know, things like food allergies, you know, the IgE mediated food allergies, um, things like even even higher level, you know, neural wiring, uh, sort of autism spectrum, ADHD. Those are starting to point back to the gut, the development of, you know, the gut and early early population of uh, and colonization of the good bacteria patterns there. And, and so, and, and again, it's all connected food supply, uh, cesarean birth, even, you know, I mean, it, they can catch up to, um, you know, natural birth. It takes about six months to, to catch up. In fact, to, for gut populations to, to reach this sort of, 
equal levels as you would see in, in a vaginal birth. And so, you know, even, even there in the very beginning, we, we start to see, you know, potential deficiencies. And, and so, you know, patients are generally, I think, aware of this idea of, you know, the gut microbiome, the idea that the healthy bacteria, you know, they've probably heard of that. And then patients also, a lot of them, you know, are, are aware of, well, yogurt is, it has probiotics and that can help my gut. And certainly I think, you know, you can make <clears throat> general recommendations that way. Uh, probiotic supplements are available and they have been shown in, you know, placebo controlled trials to have effects on, you know, ratios of healthy, you know, I, I mentioned this, you know, firmicutes to bacteroidetes. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it, it resets that, gets that in a better shape, and so it reduces systemic inflammation. Do you take that every day? Um, do, you, do you take that every day or just when you kind of know things are going to be thrown off? Yeah, I, I don't. I am, try to include things like sauerkraut is a great, really? you know, sort of natural what about probiotic. Beer? Yeah, believe it. Anything that's what about like real fermented, beer? yeah, beer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Anything that's, you know, gone through a fermentation what about hard process, bourbon? generally speaking. <laughs> That's right. have a more the better chris <laughs> so uh, anyway yeah but beer yeah, yeah okay so you yeah. get a little red wine uh you know it has some of these probiotics but you certainly yogurt um you know and then think also in terms of prebiotics what you, you what you feed these guys uh will determine populations as well and so you know high fiber foods you know bananas uh avocados uh, certainly uh, leafy green vegetables, plant leaves, you know, a lot of the stuff that we don't digest, but it makes it to the gut intact, uh, these non-digestible carbohydrates. And this is what the gut, you know, they, they ferment. They either consume in total or, this is really cool, they ferment what they can and leave off. it. You know, things like sialic acid gets cleaved, makes it through the intestinal wall, and does really cool things like neuroplasticity mm. in the mm. brain, um, you know. So there's there's that benefit as well. But I would recommend to patients, you know, of, like you might normally, you know, maybe you consider, you know, uh, eating better. Uh, certainly, uh, there are direct effects of these probiotic supplements uh, that that you know are beneficial. Have been demonstrated to be you know very beneficial. And then you know these foods uh, that can do it again. Yogurt's a great choice. Most people like yogurt. The risk with yogurt is that it's, you know, if you can get a low right. sugar right. option, a Greek yogurt's pretty good, you know, because that can be, you know, kids love yeah, yogurt. But it's but not the you kind of yogurt label, you're talking like about. 80 right. grams of sugar. Yeah, it's, oof, you know, it, it's a lot. So, you know, if you want to get, you know, non-sweetened or, or, you know, maybe Greek yogurt, if it's real Greek yogurt, throw some berries in there, you know, to sweeten it up a little. That's, that's a good option. You know, that's, that's what we've done with our kids and they, they like that fine. So that's, that strikes good. me as like, um, more of this, like, can you do this without being a homesteader? I think you can like, like, for example, you know, we've, we've grown, we've tried to grow things in the house we have now. We've got a lot of trees. Like we've, we've been here for about nine years. And before we bought this house, um, we had a, I, I built a raised garden, in uh in a because the other house we had just didn't have as many trees around so we were able to get a lot of light to it well one of the downsides here is there's just no place to grow something but it strikes me so since so when when moving we uh i took i started taking the kids down to a there's a saint vincent de paul house which is a sort of a um they they give out um you know, foods to, to people in the public that are, that need it. And then like, it's a thrift yeah, store, yeah, but then they also have uh, in the back of this St. Vincent de Paul house, we've uh, built a organic garden and it's amazing. Like it's super, super cool. Wow. And, uh, and they get a lot of those vegetables that they give away every week. They get from that garden all summer long. And I, I always go wow. down there and we'll, we'll uh, most of what I do with my kids is like, um, the grunt work, you know, it's the laying of the, the mulch and it's the tilling and it's the watering. Um, but then once harvest comes around, like they, they had planted okra and I love, I love okra, like fried okra from being in Oklahoma. Um, sure. but I don't ever think I've like picked okra off of a vine. Right. So like, so you're out there harvesting and you get this big old thing of okra, pick it off the vine. And like, I could eat this, no salt, no pepper, no olive oil, no <laughs> vinegar, not fried. And it was awesome. Right. 
And so, so like, I think there's some of that, that, and same thing like tomatoes, the tomatoes on the vines taste different than the tomatoes that I would grow in my own garden, or it's certainly different than what you sure. get from the grocery store. So like, you yeah. know, but that's, you know, work and people don't want to do that type of stuff in their yards. It's tough. Yeah, it really is. But I mean, you're, you're totally onto something though. I mean, we're talking about, and I don't wash um, it off. Like I didn't care about washing it off. My hands have dirt on them. It's like, who cares? You know, like there's probably something I was like helping. Right. Right. My kids get to do the same thing. Absolutely. I mean, getting your hands in the dirt again, getting dirty, reasonably dirty, uh, I think is, you know, it's a fantastic, I mean, the data on people, you know, who are raised on a farm, Mm are pretty, I mean, it's really interesting. I'll send you uh, some papers on this, uh, but they're, they don't get sick as often. There's a lower incidence of autoimmune disease. Um, you know, again, what you're talking about on a farm, generally speaking, is a exposure to more bacteria. You're out there, you know, work on the land and, and that contributes greatly to exposure. Uh, But then also the kinds of foods that you eat, generally speaking, um, you know, especially if you're, it depends on what you're harvesting, of course, but, you know, in that kind of community, you're, you're growing your own vegetables. And, you know, my, uh, my, my grandmother and grandfather, they, uh, you know, had a farm in Indiana and, and they would basically, and they came to Arizona of all places in the, in about 1960, and they started a garden uh, in the backyard here, even though it's, you know, a desert, but they were able to grow with, you know, they kind of contrived a situation <laughs> to make it work. And, and we'd always go over there and they've radishes and, you know, of course, tomatoes and whatever else. And they eat everything that grows out of the ground, you know, leafy greens and all the cabbage you, you could want. And, uh, and yeah, I think that that's a huge factor is a, the exposure and then B you're also feeding, uh, you're eating, you know, some of the bacteria as well, which sounds weird, but it's, it's actually quite good for you. And then, you know, you're feeding them mm. with, you know, these, these fibers, these, you know, all the fiber that we, you know, don't maybe normally get the genetic diversity of, of tomatoes has been really well characterized. It's gone from it, it you know, store-bought tomatoes from hundreds of genes down to like wow. four basically. And, wow. and so it's like, you know, no wonder we've, we're eating these rubber right. balls, you know, that we call tomato. Yeah, they're, they've been bred for, you know, this robust, they can withstand being dropped on the floor, you know, that kind of thing. Ah, it's, it doesn't mean they're great for you. I mean, you could eat something worse, sure. of course, but it's, yeah, better to yeah have some of that diversity, the natural growth of fewer yeah, pesticides, antibiotics, and that kind of thing. And I'm, I'm not an alarmist that way, but I just, you, know, you got to recognize that there is a healthier way. It does take time. And it's, it does take effort sometimes. Now you said, um, and that's, that's you trick. said that you think in 15 years, we're going to be rethinking all of these things. Do you think that, do you think that big pharma is going to have to have jump on board with this? Cause it seems to me that like a lot of the, the things that we're involved in right now, and I'm not throwing, you know, big pharma under the bus, so to speak. I think they do it. There's a lot of great things that we, that we can treat because we wouldn't otherwise have a way to treat, but you know, there's this cycle of inflammation cycle of more sugar in our diets, more processed foods in our diets, uh, whether or not that, I mean, I think it's, I think it's, I, I believe it's probably safe to say that that contributes to some of the things that we see as within aging. I don't think there's a lot of people that would disagree with that oh, yeah. even within, in pharma. So, um, so how do you, you know, if, if the solution is like eat right, take care of yourself, you know, dig in the dirt a little bit, if that's the solution and we do mm-hmm. that all of our lives, that's not a sexy solution that's going to generate a bunch of money for, for other people. So how do we get this? How do we, how does that change in 15 years? Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, you make great points and almost certainly sugar, fats, lack of activity, all of this contributes to, you know, uh, health, uh, disease. And, and I mean, most certainly, and the data show that as well. I think that we we run up against a difference of philosophy when it comes to to big pharma, even even Western medicine in general. You know, we we wait until something's yeah. broken. You know, diagnosis, indication, treatment, and that's fine. And certainly, you need to help people that have something go wrong. But this is it lines up more with the preventative approach to things. And 
And by, you know, saying in 10 to 15 years, I think we need to, you know, look at things differently, like everything goes through the gut. Well, by extension, I think this is a preventative way of looking at things. And so you've probably seen a little bit more of this, you know, sort of attitude of prevention start to bubble to the surface. I mean, there are people that are, you know, doing their own research and figuring out that, well, yeah, I can take steps to really improve my situation, my health. I see, I feel differences, you know, I, I exercise a little bit, that's great. I've changed my diet. Wow, you know, maybe Lincoln running, you know, cross country is like, I had extra energy, you know, I can, you know, I, I felt like I could just yeah. go all day. You know, maybe it's something he's eating, you know, consistently, whatever. Getting better sleep, you know, that's another thing. Sleep gets compromised when, when all of this gets thrown out of whack. So what I'm saying is that I, I think that, you know, this, gut thing could lead to a more sort of global acceptance of a preventative approach because you have to get that right. First step is the hmm. gut. I mean, it sounds weird, but you know, you take I care of that I wanted you to say it's the eyes, Jim. Then... Come on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would be a lot easier I, for me. I wish That'd I could. That would be easier for me. <laughs> I wish I could. I love the eyes. But... <laughs> But there'll still be myopia, Chris. <laughs> okay. you, you'll Fair be fine. <laughs> so uh, don't worry about that. Um, but yeah, you, you take that that first step of the gut. And of course, it's necessary then to say, well, okay, how do I do good by my gut? Well, you know, you've got to eat right. Um, certainly, there's some exercise that's involved there as well. Um, you know, reduce sugars, uh, reduce fats, uh, that kind of thing. And so, you know, I, I it's maybe science is slow and you know maybe it's more like 20 or 30 years but i you know i'm optimistic i think that you know we may be able to with all of this overwhelming pile of data that we have uh you know it's it's convinced me um certainly and um you know and we're still learning i mean we've only scratched the surface really of of what's going on here but but i think that you know if you look just across the lifespan you look at you know like i said it's a, basically an equal ratio of our own cells to the number of microbes in the body that's astonishing to me still, um, you know, it's, it starts so early in life and it gets calibrated the first thousand days of life, really your, your pattern of bacteria, you know, you're learning, your body's learning about its environment, uh, you know, in the womb you are as well, but you get those bacteria that colonize, um, they're set up in ratios that are designed, you know, for you. And partly that's genetic, partly that's exposure, of course, uh, to pathogens, to, you know, you know, healthy bacteria. And, uh, and that's your immune system. It's designed, it's calibrated, like literally by the time you're three, you know, and it's scary because you maintain that throughout your life. You can change balances, thankfully, you know, going forward, but it will tend to go back to that ratio. These, this pattern, this profile of, uh, of bacteria, you know, if, if you don't, you know, tweak with it, or if, it, if you don't, you know, live healthy. Yeah. So yeah, it's, Wild. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. The most common questions I get include, what ophthalmological codes or evaluation and management codes should I use? What ICD-10 codes do I need to build with this CPT code? What CPT codes can be built together and what can't? And my favorite, how do I manage a patient who has diabetes who comes in for a quote unquote routine eye exam? These questions really highlight the confusion and uncertainty that serves as a daunting hurdle for providers, makes it more challenging for them to care for their patients and provide those patients with the best opportunity for a lifetime of ocular health and clear vision. That's why we built iCode Education for this specific purpose. Our mission is to provide optometrists with resources to help you understand disease states, revenue cycles, and billing and coding so that you can put that on autopilot and truly care for your patients. Check out iCodeEducation.com. That's E-Y-E-C-O-D-E Education.com. We've developed a premier billing and coding bundle that includes all of our billing and coding resources in one place. We also have a 10% discount code just for listeners of this podcast. Enter the coupon code E-Y-E-C-O-D-E-M-E-D-I-A-22 at checkout. We'd love to work with you. Check out iCodeEducation.com. One of the challenging things with patients is that when they invest in a really high quality pair of glasses and customized lenses, occasionally it can be difficult to keep those lenses clean, scratch-free, and smudge-free. Now, 
We have the ability with Crizal Sapphire HR lenses to offer our patients a best-in-class anti-reflective coating that is also resistant to scratches, smudges, and deposits. This means that patients spend more time enjoying clear and comfortable vision and less time caring for their lenses. So remember that you can provide patients with the best in quality, best in class, transparency, clarity, durability, and UV protection in a single Crizal coating. If you want to learn more about Crizal Sapphire HR, contact your Essilor account executive or visit EssilorPro.com backslash Crizal. Pretty awesome. I, so I, uh, one other thought escaped me and I'm sure I'm going to think about it as soon as, as soon as we get offline. But in any case, I, I think, um, I think, oh, this is what it was. Great. It was, I almost want to ask patients when they come in and I don't, I haven't done this, but, but like, it, it, it's kind of striking to me when I think about just even like preventative stuff within the ocular surface or within the macula. And I have conversations with patients where you're, where you're so early into the system, right? Like, like I might push on a meibomian gland and it comes out as toothpaste and the patient's 25 years old and completely asymptomatic, no visual fluctuation, no you know, no burning, no grittiness, but you can see one to two plus telangiectasia. The eyelids look horrible. And, uh, and then you show them and they're like, eh, whatever my contacts, you know, so I'm fine. Uh, and then, and then you're like, yeah, but in 15 years, you're not going to be fine. And then five, you're going to want LASIK because your contacts are uncomfortable. And then 10 years after that, you're going to want, uh, you're, you're, you're going to want your rip your eyes out. And because they're, they're yeah. so uncomfortable. And, um, and I can see this, you know, I, I, I can predict their future of what's going to happen. And it happens, you know, and, and when it happens and I've told people like, I, I'm, a, I mean, I'm not, I'm not okay with it, but I do what I can do. But my point in saying that is like, I almost want to ask people when they first sit down in my chair for the very first time I see them is like, do you want me to talk to you about prevention or do you just want me to treat you whenever you have a problem? And I just, I need to know, like, yeah. I want to, I want to be preventative. But I just want to know, like, what do you yeah. want out of this? And if you want me to be preventative, then let's have some weird conversations about your gut health and about your, you know, about your ocular surface in 15 years and what you can do now to impact that in your, your macula. But if you just want me to, like, treat a problem as it arises, I'm here for you. I'll do that. But, um, but like, I just need to know. <laughs> you know what I mean? I know, I know yeah, doctors don't have yeah. that conversation, but it's an interesting one I've thought about. Yeah. And, and it's, I mean, it's almost a disease in itself feeling good. Everything's good right yeah. now. And, you know, I, I did, most of my studies were conducted on, you know, the quote unquote, healthy young individuals, college age students, 18 to 25 years old. And, you know, they're all like, you know, I, I feel great. I'm fine. You know, no worries. And, you know, you almost have to, in some ways, I think shock mm. them a little like, okay, macular degeneration Make them a 40 is a year old for a week disease <laughs> yeah <laughs> with with gi I upset. live in my body yeah, yeah. right <laughs> my shoulder aches yeah. a little or more a than i wanted to yeah. Uh, yeah. experience <laughs> that yeah right uh, anyway um yeah uh, joints are popping i know it's it's terrible but um but yeah so and and i definitely remember being young and just bouncing off whatever and i'm fine you know it, it, you could I could eat, you know, a pizza yeah. and then just yeah. go run, run a marathon. No worries. No worries. Right. And uh, yeah, you can't do that anymore. But but the, the point is, is that, you know, these these diseases that are really serious. I mean, we want to hang on to our vision as long as we can. Certainly our cognition and, you know, these age of onsets are going backwards. Mm. Uh, you know, so, you know, the, the National Eye Institute a few years ago changed, you know, macular degeneration's definition a leading cause of visual disability and those over 65 to over mm. 60. And now we have legitimate cases of macular degeneration in people in their fifties. Yeah. Yep. Wow. We're going backwards. And, you know, and I'm not, I'm not saying all of it's connected to the gut, but you know, certainly that contributes to it. And to your point, I think that, you know, we, we probably would help ourselves a lot, you know, or help patients certainly by saying, listen, you know, you're not, 50 or 60 or 70 right now. Uh, but you know, maybe you have experienced Alzheimer's disease or know somebody who has, maybe it's a grandmother, or grandfather. Um, you, we don't want that, you know, here's how I know you're 22, but you know, here's how you get way out in front of that. And there's a ton of evidence to support this. And along the way, you're going to feel even better. You'll perform better. 
And so, you know, I, I had these conversations with, you know, students that participated in, you know, my trials and I still am in contact with several of them. They'll email me and this is from, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And they'll say, I'm still taking my, my macular carotenoids, you know, taking Macu health mm. and, uh, you know, and, and it's fantastic. And they're like, I, this is great. You know, I mean, my friends are saying their joints are aching and mine aren't. And it's like joints. Okay. That's cool. Anti-inflammatory, uh, their vision and glare and, you know, all the effects and, you know, that you see with that, not to mention reducing risk of macular degeneration. So, you know, that's all good. Uh, you know, Alzheimer's is the same kind of conversation. We can do a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, there are genetics involved, but wow, I was, well, I was know, reading some stuff people for... like like legitimately reversing, you know, Alzheimer's, yeah. Yeah. which is not how we think about it. Yeah. No, not at all. I mean, you know, you think about neural cells, and once they're compromised, they generally don't, you know, regenerate. Uh, right. uh, they they are gone, right? And so. But what's happening with, with Alzheimer's disease in particular has been demonstrated is that the neuroplasticity yeah. part, you know, so you have, maybe you lose a quarter of your neurons, you know, and that's not a good situation, but you, of those remaining neurons, you know, if you can stimulate them with healthy, you know, nutrients, um, you know, we're talking about like, you know, DHA, uh, certainly lutein is really highly represented in the brain. You promote neuroplasticity, which, you know, we showed in a study from the University of Georgia, uh, and, and you rewire neuron. They make new circuits. Neurons are great at doing that when things are healthy and you're not swimming in inflammation. Um, you know, so it's not all downhill necessarily. You're right. So, you know, even if you're able to maintain function, you know, that's a, a huge win, uh, for, for a disease like that, for sure. And so, you know, I, I think that, you know, in some ways you don't want to scare your patient into doing something, but you know, it's like, this is serious business. And, it's the sixth leading cause of death in America, of Alzheimer's yeah. disease, Jeez. you know, and that's, that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, you know, what you know I want to get up there one in eight. People. I want Jim, honestly, like, like uh, my partner is building Clark, 70 year old guy. I want to be, I want to be like Clark, right? Like, honestly, like I can't yeah. knock him yeah. too much because like about his diet and I wasn't intending to do that, but it's like, I want to be able to do a burpee no. with guys that are 30 years old. Yeah. Right. I want to go out and be able to run <laughs> three miles and, and do some push ups and, and sit ups. And like, I, I want to be able to do that when I'm 80 years old. So, and there's yeah. no reason, there's no reason we, we can't do, I mean, yes, of course. Like, could I have an aneurysm? Could I have a, a heart attack? You know, cause I've, I've, I have a, a weird genetic thing, right? Yeah. Okay. I can't control sure. for that, Yeah, but, but I can control for this other stuff. And, and I think you've, you've encouraged me certainly to think about it even more seriously um, just about what I'm doing, not just for myself, but for my kids, you know, and, and for them to have the same conversation, you know, like this is what they want to do. And they want to have like, they want to have their fitness. Cause people, people always ask like, well, would you rather have your brain or your body? It's like, no, that's not a, that, like, you can't separate the two. If I, if, if my mind was, was not present, who would care if I look like Arnold Schwarzenegger or not? I wouldn't care. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't imp improve right, my, my right. quality of life. And if, you know, if I have, if I have a body that can't, can barely function, but my brain is really like, uh, you know, acute, then, um, I, I don't think that those really go hand in hand very well. So yeah, yeah. I'm on a mission. No, you're, you're thinking about it, right? Yeah, no, I, I, I love it. I mean, and you know, the, the key to, to six, I mean, we, we want to help people. What is a famous quote? We want to help people die young mm. at the oldest age possible, ah, <laughs> you know? It. And so you just have to behave like you're young and, you know, do what, I mean, you know, obviously you want to eat well and all of that, but you know, uh, get out there and play, yeah. you know, and do things. And I, I know you exercise, you're an avid exerciser. I am too. And it's, uh, you know, it, it, that's fantastic. So you trick your body almost into being like, okay, I need to be, I need to upregulate muscle. I need to, you know, uh, provide energy. I need to, you know, instruct this guy to eat the right foods, you know, so that I can have the energy to do these things and maintain health. And so it's, it's a big ask, you know, for most folks, uh, certainly, and life is busy and, and it's hard to be disciplined as an adult, you know, because yeah, it is, you know, we have all of the sugar and all of the, you know, tasty stuff right here at our fingertips and all of the other things that are healthy tend to be a little harder to get to. And, you know, it, it's yeah. hard. Discipline is a big part of it, but, uh, you know, exercise as well. Discipline, but you can form the control, habits, but yeah, um, the discipline will form a habit. Yeah, exactly. It easier. Just, it's hard to form that habit. Exactly. 
Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And so, and, and with diet, it can be done. Like you say, you start craving things like broccoli, like where'd that come from? Yeah. <laughs> but it can happen, right? I mean, I, I have those cravings too. It's sounds a little silly to most people, but yeah, it can be done for sure. Um, yeah, but, uh, but I think, yeah, really, this is, this is a, a really positive way forward. Uh, and, and again, my hope is that, you know, here in 10 to 15 years, we start really as a general population, taking the preventative approach more seriously. Uh, like really we can make a huge difference and uh, it's not just some sort of 1% niche group that, that does this. And, um, you know, I, I think that this gut stuff could potentially lead to that because if we view things, you know, from the gut perspective, um, you know, follow your gut, maybe hey, that's the title of the paper, done. right? That's the title uh, of anyway, the podcast so everything. That's what you, thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. My my Christmas gift. Anyway, so uh, yeah, so I think that, yeah, it really, everything's kind of flowing through. And, and this is coming from, you know, I mean, I'm, again, vision scientist, neuroscientist, and, uh, you know, but I lead with the brain, you know, and the retina. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting new change of perspective for me as well, but certainly involves those tissues. But, um, but yeah, I am humbled by all of this. And I think it stands to benefit people a lot. And once we understand it. Yeah, well, Dr. Jim Stringham, thanks again. Thanks so much for being on. And, you know, I, it, I, it was a lot of fun. Where can people find you? I, I always give you the opportunity. Uh, I, I love that that you, obviously, Macu Health is a sponsor of, of this uh, podcast. I, I, uh, that allows, you know, just to, to go into this a little bit, you know, that allows, uh, you know, iCode is not never about just sucking stuff out of iCode. We, you know, we, it allows us to build a new studio and to offer new programs and to reach more people. And, and that's been great. And so thank you so much for that partnership. Where can be, but I also like that we had a conversation for an hour and I think, I think Macu Health came up one time. Um, and, and I, <laughs> I, I appreciate that because, because not just because, um, like I love talking about Macu Health. It's great for, for my patients, but, you're a wealth of knowledge that uh, people have access to, and they should know that they're getting um, information that's not that's not what's weird. It's not biased, uh, and it doesn't it doesn't necessarily. I mean, I think it could serve uh, your company, but it doesn't necessarily serve the company in in an obvious way, right? If I live well, if I eat well, um, you know, like that doesn't really necessarily serve MacuHealth directly, right? It might indirectly, but thanks for having that conversation. Uh, I really appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, and, and I appreciate that too. I mean, it, for me, it's all about the science. Uh, I mean, that's why I'm with Macu Health is, you know, everything's really scientifically vetted and it, it benefits folks, of course. Uh, but I, I feel like this is really important information to get out as well. And, and so, yeah, just yeah, I'm genuine. You know, it's it's all about science, and it's uh, you know, this is this is cool. I'm, I want to get people this information, and if they want more information about this or or Macu Health, uh, feel free to reach out to me at J Stringham. That's S T R I N G H A M Stringham at MacuHealth.com, and uh, I'm happy to you know go back and forth, have a conversation. Um, I'm actually excited to do that. So feel free. Don't be awesome. shy. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. 